the recording here. All right, so uh, welcome to uh, lecture three. This is information system security. Uh, so far, or let's say last week, we looked at uh, planning for security. Basically, one of the key aspects or key component of that lecture has to do with uh, developing a strategic plan. Developing a strategic plan. And I made mention that uh, with a strategic plan, of course, uh, every organization has a goal. And then that goal, whatever strategic plan you develop, you know, should be geared towards attaining that goal. And I remember I spoke about uh, the tactical plan as well and also operational plan. So you have a strategic plan, tactical plan, and operational plan. And then I think uh, the same last week, uh, we looked at how uh, organization or business can develop a strategic plan and i give the outline and of course i use invest of ghana strategic plan for that to explain that and i also made mention that there are i think four you know three main components of a strategic plan uh the vision the mission core values and also uh, the step-by-step -step processes or strategic processes that you take in attaining organizational goal now today we are looking at we are going to look at planning for contingencies planning for contingencies and as you know i always want the class to be very interactive so i am still i'm going to ask this question in class of course we have done planning so when they say contingencies what does it mean so the floor is open what what do you mean by contingency when they say contingency what does it mean and why do you think that we need to plan for contingencies. Please, uh, if you want to respond, all you need to do is to just raise up your hand and I'll give you the floor. Let's discuss. Many of you are already working in the security sector or security uh, department. Okay, Daniel. Hello, sir. Uh, Daniel, Contingency yes. refer to making provision for known, for known things or uncertainties. Yes, yes. So, uh, yes, of course, you know, there can always be uh, an accident or maybe there are certain things that may happen. And in fact, you may have to ensure business continuity. Any other, any other contingencies? Okay, Frederick, Fred. Uh, yes, sir. I think any unplanned events can also be tend as, yes, contingencies. Okay. On plan events, okay. Any other? Any other? Okay, so let me ask this question. Uh, I know that many of you are already working in business organizations, and like I keep saying, security in organizations is the responsibility of all. And I believe that uh, since the responsibility of all, there's a lot of things that organizations do that keep uh, the employees in the loop when it comes to issues of contingency, when it comes to issues of security. Because if you are not, uh, you don't have knowledge concerning the security and how you can help the organization to protect the confidentiality, availability, and integrity of the organizational data, organizational assets, then it's problematic. Everyone needs to understand the security issues within the organization. So my question to you is that, uh, can you briefly, anyone at all, tell about how your organization uh, how they have been able to put certain measures in place in ensuring or taking care of issues of contingency. You may want to share a small perspective. Today, everything we are going to do has to do with the contingency. And if, if you own a private business, your own business, you may also want to share what measures have you put in place to ensure that uh, unplanned events are taken care of. Please, the, the floor is still open to the class. Uh, sorry, the question is open. All right, so Clement. Clement first, then Alexander will follow. Clement. All right, thanks, Doc. So with my organization, when it comes to uh, our data. Okay, data. Uh, we, yes, we look, we look at um, preserving our data so that in case um, anything happens and then we happen to lose them, we have places where we can pick them from. So the server is um, constantly um, saves whatever we have, 
And then we have um, external drives that we back up stuff data on so that in case anything happens, we can have access to even the external drive to be able to get back our data that we need. Okay, thank you very much. Any other? Uh, so Alex. Okay, good evening, sir. Yes, evening, Alex. Uh, in my organization, all the servers are plugged into a UPS. So okay. in case there is a power outage, there's a backup power mm -hmm. from the UPS before the, um, the plant is turned on. So we don't lose connectivity for long. All right, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. So I know that if I still give the chance, many people may want to express their views. Of course, let me take uh, Prince, then we continue Prince. Prince, uh, you have the floor, please. Uh, is there anyone here who owns his own business, a private business, and how do you take care of contingencies? Hello, is there anyone here? You know, when you talk about unplanned events, it can be, uh, it can be a natural disaster. Anyway, we shall look at them in details. Anyone, Prince, your hand is up, but you are not saying anything. I'll give you the floor. Uh, I think I cannot hear you. You may be speaking, but I cannot hear you. Okay, so it's possible you're having a network issue. So you let's move on. And then uh, later on, you may want to adjust your network very well so that later on, if you have uh, any issues, comments or contributions, you can make it. Work. Anyway, so today's lecture, we are looking at, you understand the need for contingency planning. Know the major components of contingency that you create a simple set of contingency plans using business impact analysis. Then prepare and execute tests of contingency plans and also understand combined contingency plan. Now, uh, just as, I don't know whether Alexander or uh, he said a contingency plan has to also do with uh, unexpected events. So when the use of technology is actually disrupted and business operation comes to a halt, then meaning that you know there is an unplanned event so now we need to be able to uh, make provision for ensuring the continu the continuity of our business you know that uh, in every organi organizational asset data is very important so one of the un unexpected events that may occur is that this data within the organization can be hijacked or uh, a hacker can use some sort of a virus or whatever to hijack the whole data in a way that the organization cannot move. And that is actually an intrusion or accessing the data without authorization. There are other ways of putting the organization also at fault. For instance, when there is fire outbreak or let's say when there is flood, these are all uh, unplanned events and they can happen at any time. So organization or businesses must plan in a way that when such events happens, they can be able to ensure continuity of their business. Now, so there are also procedures that are required that will permit the organization to continue essential function of uh, if our information technology support is interrupted. You know, in our case, we are dealing with information technology or let's say information uh, assets. So basically we are not looking at holistic uh, contingency planning, but we are looking at the IT, how we can make provision to, to ensure continuity of information technology assets or to ensure the continuity of the business as a result of information technology, information systems assets. Now over 40% of businesses that don't have this disaster plan go out of business after a major loss. So imagine that uh, you have a small business and your business, uh, you have a small machine running and this machine is connected to a server. So everything is within the server. And let's assume that there is a, a natural disaster, let's say rain, within that same environment where your business is running, you have all the information technology assets, your data is sitting there and all that. And there is, let's say, fire outbreak or, or flood. You will come to realize that if you don't have plan to ensure continuity, this business will end up collapsing. So we are going to look at this contingency planning, planning for contingency in three different ways. First, we have what we call incident response planning. We have the disaster recovery planning. And the last one, we look at the business continuity. Before then, let's look at the definition to, uh, right? 
contingency planning. So overall planning for unexpected events is called contingency planning. So it is how organizational planners position the organization to prepare for, detect, react to, and recover from events that threaten the security of information resources and assets. And of course, the main goal is to restore to normal modes of operation so that you can have your business running. So uh, planning for this contingency is what we are looking at. And I'm saying that uh, we are going to look at it into three ways. Uh, we have planning, incident response planning, disaster recovery planning, and business continuity planning. So every organization must ensure that he has IRP, he has DRP, and he has BC, uh, BCP. Usually, you need to form a team for all these. And then I think that along the line, uh, I'll ask questions regarding uh, themes of contingency planning in your organization. So you have the incident response planning team, disaster recovery planning team, and business continuity uh, planning. So now let me ask this question. What is incident response? What is incident response? You don't have a plan. What is incident response? Hello? What is incident response? Any questions? OK, Clement. Hello? No, I, I think um, incident response, from my point of view, would be um, an action towards um, something taking place immediately. OK. So for instance, uh, can you give an example? So an example would be, if our server room is to catch fire, okay. what will be the actions that we take, the immediate actions to take? Very good, you are right. So, uh, you know, there are certain things that you suspect, which you suspect to be an incident. Or let's say, sometimes it's not necessarily uh, someone intruding into the system, but the organization may have challenges. For instance, the teller, may be having problems with the mouse. And having a problem with the mouse is an incident. So you have to report to the appropriate you know, department and then they will issue a ticket. They will issue a ticket number. Okay, and then you make a complaint that you're having a problem with your mouse and they will send somebody to come and fix it for you. And since we are actually going to talk about security, anything that you suspect, that you suspect to be uh, an intrusion, you quickly have, to, you need to trigger. Once you trigger, then the team called incident response team will have to come and then respond to it immediately. Sometimes they may be able to handle the issue as soon as possible. In other, in other times, the incident may escalate to the extent that they cannot handle it at that instant and it becomes a disaster to the organization. So in this case, you move on to what we call disaster recovery. Already we have a disaster. For instance, when there's a flood, and that you are not able to control, or maybe you are not able to find a solution to the flood instantly, meaning that the problem has escalated from an being an incident to a disaster. So uh, a disaster has occurred. So what next? You need to now put up a team in order to find a way to recover, and then uh, to recover the information asset. Usually, the disaster recovery works hand in hand with the business continuity. So the business continuity is also to ensure that the business is running. There is a disaster, there is flood, there is fire outbreak, but we must ensure that our business continue. So you need to put in plans to ensure that uh, your business continues when there is an incident or when the incident escalates to disaster, how do you ensure continuity of your business? So we shall look at these one after the other, of course. Let's look at... Uh, uh, this part to ensure continuity across all contingency plan processes during planning process. Contingency planning should one, you identify the mission or business critical functions. So once there is uh, uh, an issue, or let's say you are, you are developing a plan to handle contingencies, first of all, you should uh, know or identify the mission or business critical functions when you are developing a plan for contingency. The next is also identify resources that support critical functions. So for instance, uh, if you look at uh, our data, our server, 
our server is a, is, a, is a resource that actually supports all the business functions, whether marketing, human resource, uh, IT, and all other departments. So it is very important you also identify those resources that you need to uh, 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 plan in, in case there is any uh, disaster. Then you anticipate potential contingencies or disaster. Yes, of course, you need to anticipate that uh, uh, where we are, there can be fire outbreak, there can be flood, uh, someone, you know, with any uh, slightest issue, somebody, there are people who may have interest in our organization and they want to intrude in terms of hijacking our data and all that. So you need to anticipate all that so that you can now make a good plan. Then you select contingency plan strategies. So all these plans that you do, you need to actually, you will develop different strategies. For instance, we shall have a strategy or a plan for, uh, a strategy for handling incidents, a strategy for handling disaster, and a strategy for business continuity. So if there is an incident, you need to select the right strategy to handle the incident. And if, there is a, if the incident is escalates, to disaster, then you need to take the right strategy in order to handle the disaster. And then, uh, of course, I said disaster work hand in hand with the business continuity. Then, of course, you need to implement the strategy, test and then revise the contingency plans. So, uh, once there's a disaster or an incident, you trigger a strategy to handle it. After implementing that strategy, the next step is that you need to now find out revise all the processes that you went through in handling that contingency, whether it was well done or things did not go well. So you can put in measures to handle that. Now, I need to mention that, you know, apart from having the contingency team, we have sub team. We have the incident recovery team, disaster recovery team, and the business continuity team. And then uh, you see in every organization, major organizations, at least in uh, some few firms that I worked with when I was in Europe, uh, I remember I was part of the incident recovery team. So usually the same employees within the organization are all assigned different teams. So some of you may be assigned to be part of an uh, incident recovery team. Uh, some may be also asked to be part of the disaster recovery team and all that. So I want to ask the class, where you work now, uh, do you have these teams in, in case of a, a, a contingency or unplanned events? Of course, the contingency planning team is always at the top management level. And then of course you have all these sub teams. So do you have such teams in your organization and which team do you belong to? And you may want to share your perspective on some of your activities. So the floor is open, please. Musa, okay, Rafik, Rafik, you are going to say something, please. Okay, sir. Uh, for yes. us, we are a small firm. We do we do not have uh, those teams because uh, because of our numbers, it's difficult to have segregation of duties yes. among us. However, yes. uh, uh, principally, what we have put in place is the disaster recovery. Okay. okay, it is not really a written policy document, but then you say, okay, should my server crash, what is the next thing? Do I have, do I do a backup onto a data center? I mean, some of those stuff. All right. But it is thank not like much, a well-written policy document. Okay, Rafi, uh, thank you very much. Before I give uh, Mufat the floor, you see, uh, yes, uh, Rafi, yes, I agree with you. You know, some businesses, are big, they have all the resources in place. Yes, there is the need to have all these uh, uh, teams, but some businesses are small or organizations are small. You don't need to have all these four teams. You don't need to have all these four teams. You can just have a single team and call it contingency plan team. And this team are responsible for the incident disaster and also business continuity. It's just like uh, uh, data math, no, sorry, just like operational database and also data warehouse. It's not every organization that implements data warehouse. It is the bigger ones that actually have massive data sets 
and also they have good resources to go for data warehouse. If you have a small company, you don't need a data warehouse. You just depend on operational all the transactional database. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve, uh, Steve, is it Mufat? Mufat, are you the one? Yes, Doc. Yes, Mufat, take the floor. Thank you very much, Doc. So, um, for where, where I work, work Mufat? Kolibu Teaching Hospital. Oh, okay. Yes, please. All right. So, for Go where ahead. I work, um, we just migrated onto. Uh, an online uh, platform. So for us okay. not to be losing a lot of data, we now have a we've device where we can keep hard copies of the receipts of, of okay. every uh, transaction. So in case um, the online or everything we do online goes off, we can rely on the hardware. Mm. Oh, sorry, I All said right. the hardware. On the hard copies. The, the, the hard copies. Okay. Yes, please. So, uh, me. So, do you have a formal team, more or less, called contingency planning team, or let's say? Yes, they do. They do. Okay. But it's at. Uh, it's, I'm at a department, so okay. they have it at main administration. All right. Yes. So it's, you uh, yes, please. Okay. So now we are going to start with the incidents response team. What goes into the plan? What goes into it? And how do you plan uh, towards incidents response? And of course, we have um, established the, the, the definition of incidence response. And then uh, I, I don't know whether it's uh, uh, Francis or so. He said, you know, when there is an issue, that you provide immediate response. So usually, when there's an incident, you're able to handle it uh, immediately. You're able to handle it immediately. And sometimes you may have someone, you have organizational system, and then you realize that uh, there is an unusual activity, meaning that someone is intruding. You can quickly realize that the lock, the organizational lock, the system lock, uh, there has been someone within the system lock. And if there's, sorry, then we'll call. Yeah, we'll call. I'm teaching you, can I call you after this? Yes, yeah, so uh, some of the, in, in some situations you can easily handle it. For instance, uh, you know, I keep saying that the security of the organization is the responsibility of all. And uh, you must provide training to every member of the organization, even including the, the teller. So when there's an unusual incident or the unusual thing happening, they can quickly alert or trigger and alert that something is actually happening. Quickly, the incident response team will come and attend to it. Maybe uh, there is an unusual uh, response, like maybe the system log. There has been an intrusion. Someone has entered, and it has record that someone has entered into the system, maybe from Nigeria. So this is an unusual activity. So if someone, or let's say the person managing the system log, identifies or realizes that something like this is happening, he will quickly alert the incident response team. And then there are several, there are certain things you need to do first in order to stop this. So at the incident level, you are able to, sometimes you can easily stop it. But if you're not able to stop it, and then the system is already hijacked, it means that it's no longer in the hands of the incident response team. Now there is a disaster. So you have to now find a way to manage the disaster. So a detailed set of processes and procedures that anticipate, detect and mitigate the impact of unexpected event that might compromise information resources or assets, which is the incident response. So you need to design certain processes and also certain procedures. And of course, you have a policy document uh, guarding how the incident should be handled when there is a uh, an incident. Okay, so now we are still talking about incidents. And I, I, like I said, you know, sometimes even the, the, the teller, the teller, the system that the teller is using, the system may freeze. So if the system is, is freezes and then the teller is not able to even click on a button, meaning that it's an unusual event because the expectation is that the system with all its requirements or its specification you should be working 
but all of a sudden the system has freeze. So quickly, you need to trigger the incident response team and let them know that this is the issue. So sometimes you make a call to the team. Of course, someone picks, then uh, they, they ask the issues at hand. So when they ask and they realize that it's not something that needs to be addressed as quick as possible, they can defer it for some few days, but some of them require immediate attention. So in this case, the team will come and then handle that. So when a threat becomes valid attack, it is classified as an information security incident. If it is directed against information assets, it has a realistic chance of success. It threatens the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information assets. Then it is classified as an incident. So it is important to understand that an incident response is reactive measure, but not preventive. You see, it is reactive. That it is happening. They quickly have to come and react in order to take care of the incident or the issues. Now, let's look at before an incident, uh, uh, what needs to be done or what are the, what planners needs to do when before an incident. So planners draft a set of procedures. Those tasks that must be performed in advance of the incident. Something like details of the data backup. And I remember some of you were talking about data backups, but Mufat, where I have a little bit of, you know, problem with your, your way of handling data, uh, unless of course you may want to detail me well, you mean you have the organization, the system is there, and then you also make uh, some hard copy uh, receipts, right? So in case there is a problem that you rely on the hard copy receipts, right? Is that what you said, Mufat? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, so I don't know how your system, is it outsourced or you have your own server within the hospital that is managing? So, yes. Um, so the, the software is outsourced from the ministry itself, but we do have a server as well in within Kolibu premises. We have the one main server, and then we have one backup server as well. Okay, very good. So one, there's a backup server, meaning that some of these issues shouldn't be much of a problem. And usually uh, you don't do the backup within the same organization. Uh, if you have the server, you may have a data center. Uh, you know, you may want to have a backup center in let's say Kumasi. Uh, you within the same Kualibu, you have a backup system there. You may also have a backup system somewhere because Kualibu is a very big institution, like a hospital. Maybe another backup somewhere in the US or something. So there's real time backup in all these systems. So in case uh, the one within this one fails, uh, you can pipeline whatever data from here into this. If this one fails, you can also get it. So you have several backups everywhere. That is what most of the data centers they do. So in case there's a problem, there's a disaster, uh, they can ensure continuity of their business by getting all backups in place. Okay, and of course, before that, you need to also have a disaster recovery preparation. Then training, training schedules. Uh, the disaster team, you need to train them. Uh, all the employees within the organization, you need to have them trained. Uh, the tellers, the, those at the operational level, you need to train them. The things that when they suspect, they should trigger as, and then so that the incident response team can now attend to it. And of course, you need to test whether your plan is working well. And then you have copies of service agreements, which is also very important. The reason why this is here is that some of the businesses, just as uh, Mufat is saying, they, they outsource their services. So once you outsource the services, then there should be clear, uh, the agreement should be defined within the service level agreement as to whether when there is a disaster, when there's a problem, who handles the problem. So it is very important uh, you have copies of all the service level agreement. For instance, if my firm is to provide security to your firm, 
uh, we we come out with an agreement that uh, once there's flood or when there's a problem, our company is going to do A, B, C, D. Our company is going to do A, B, C, D. And that one is clearly defined in the service level agreement. So this one needs to be kept. Why is my pencil not picking? Okay, so you need to keep copies of the service level agreement. So sometimes when there's an incident, you may have to visit the agreement and see the agreement you have with your service provider. If it is a software and the software is attacked, who handles it? Whose responsibility to do this? You must also have copies of the agreement. And of course, you must have a business continuity plan. How do you, uh, if let's say your premises where the business is actually situated and there is a fire outbreak, the whole place is burnt. You, you, may, you may have backup for the data elsewhere, but what about the space to keep uh, new devices and all that? What about the space? So we shall look at an aspect in the business continuity. We have what we call hot sites. We have warm sites and we have the cold sites. Every business organization should try as much as possible to have these sites so that when there is a disaster, especially natural disaster like this, uh, you can rely on these sites to ensure the continuity of your business. All right. So please, any question up to this stage? We look at it during the incident. So planners develop and document the procedures that must be performed during the incident. Yes. So during the incident, what will happen? Okay, so uh, the operational department has triggered an incident. It is reported to the incident response team. And the incident response team have already developed some policy documents, you know, policy documents, and also some procedures and whatever in handling incidents. For instance, they say that there's a problem with uh, the mouse. The mouse is actually having a problem. One teller is having a problem with the mouse. So quickly, uh, since you have all the procedures, uh, now the, the procedure is saying that once uh, someone make a request or report an incident that the mouse is not working, uh, the procedure is that the person, that incident should be issued a ticket number. Some organizations do that. For instance, even some of we, the customers, uh, we customers, when you make, when you call, let's say a bank or any business organization that you transact business with, and they make a complaint, you are issued a ticket. So uh, maybe the procedure is that a ticket should be issued with a number. So that any time at all you want to follow up, use that ticket number to follow up. So that's the procedure. But within the organization, certain things are handling, uh, handled immediately, especially when it is an incident. So quickly, what happened? Okay, let us, uh, this is our team. Uh, the problem is beyond any of us within the team. Let us confer or let us refer this to the software engineering department. They get someone there and then they ask the person to go and they find out if that issue can be resolved. And then these procedures are grouped and assigned to various rules. And the planning committee drafts a set of function specific procedures. So uh, with a procedure, yes, there are rules that are defined within the procedure. Uh, you, may, you may want to, uh, in, the, in, in the procedure, you may define rules for the network department. Maybe when there's an incident, the problem is has to do with the network. So what happened? How do we do? Do we have to refer the issue or get someone from the network department with that competency to quickly go and address the issue? Uh, the problem has to do with software. The problem has to do with hardware. So the team is there. Okay, it is reported. So let's refer uh, per the procedure. Let's refer this issue to the hardware department. Somebody should go to the teller and attend to the teller who has a problem with the mouse and all that. And of course, you know, with it, you always have a secretary who acts on behalf of all the teams. So when it happens, you now toss it to whether disaster recovery or uh, whatever team to handle. Now, after the incident, after the incident, there is procedure that you followed to handle the incident. Now, after that, you need to review all the processes you went through in handling the incident to see whether there are some places that uh, you, you, you fell short or there are certain, or there, there were certain things that you couldn't do it well. How do you address that? How do you take care of that? So that in future, when there's an incident, you will not struggle to handle that incident. 
Okay, so, and then uh, now we are going to pr uh, preparing to plan. So I open the floor, please, if there's any question, any contribution, anything you want to share, uh, maybe you may have had uh, experience in terms of handling an issue within your organization. You may want to share it. Uh, Omane? Yeah, um, so good evening. Yeah, good evening, Omane. Yeah, so please, we spoke about uh, testing and uh, revising the continuity plan. Um, I don't, or oh, we don't. Uh, Omane, it, it appears you. Hello, it appears you are far away from your device. I cannot hear you, actually. The words are not clear. They are blurry. Can you get closer to it, or are you are using a headphone? Uh, yeah, I'm using a headphone. Yeah, so I think it's problematic. I can't hear you well. Uh, Ahmed, can you hear him? Uh, yeah, it's... I can hear him, but just as he said, he's bled and he's far away. So, from so I'll type it. I think it's my mic. I'll type it in the, in the chat box. Okay. okay. All right. So, do you still want to go ahead or you want to resolve it before? I'll type it in the chat box. Okay. Uh, I think last, last, last two years or last year, one of my questions was that I student to, uh, I gave a case that in organization, uh, an incident, there was an incident, then I gave a specific incident. Then I said, as a member of the incident response team, then there is an incident coming or that has been reported to your department. Uh, can you discuss so detail what should be done? And then, so what it means is that I expect you to have a thorough discussion on all these. For instance, after the after the incident, what are you know you have to discuss thoroughly, like, like the first incident, uh, it has to be rules that were assigned to people. They actually did what they were supposed to do, whether there were challenges and all that, so that it can inform, you know, tomorrow's incidents, tomorrow's uh, uh, likely incidents. So something like that. Okay. Now let's look at pre preparing to plan. Uh, Omani, I will still be expecting your question. So when you get the table, when you are able to fix your problem, I'll be interested to get that question. You see, when questions and contribution comes, uh, it helps a lot so that I can stay on for a long time. So planning requires this still understanding of information systems, of course. Uh, since we are talking about planning and then we are looking at contingency, then there is a need for you to have, I mean, understanding of information systems and then the threats that information system are likely to face. Yes, uh, Rafik. Rafik, no, after sir, Rafik you, you made mention of before the incident. Yes. Yeah. I sir. said before the incident, yes. Hello. Yes, please go ahead, Rafik. I can hear you, please. Hello. Hello, Rafik. I can hear you. I'm not the one having network. The network issue. is very poor. Hello. Uh, yeah, uh, please, can someone confirm whether I'm the one having a problem? Okay, so I was asking before the incident. No, it is clear. Okay, yes, Rafik, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. So I was asking before the incident. Uh, before the incident activities, what are the activities you are expected to do before the incident? Oh, that is it's here. I think okay. it's here. And I did okay. explain that. Okay. That's fine. So things, you know, you need to ensure detailed data backup plan of uh, schedules, the disaster recovery preparation, training schedules for the members within the team, testing plans. So once you finish and then everything, you need to test that your plans and everything are well, I mean, in place to be implemented, that you need to have copies of the service level agreement and business continuity plan. So this one, you just have to discuss it. Just give a, a clear idea of what needs to be done before any incident will happen or what the planners must do, anticipating that there will be an uh, unexpected event. Then during, during the incident, what should be done? And then after the incident, that is where you do more or less like a review 
So once the procedures for handling an incident are drafted, planners develop and document procedure that must be performed immediately after the incident has separate functional. And the focus also has to do with assessing uh, whether the, the procedure, the plan, the, everything was successfully executed in handling the incident. So planning, and I'm saying that, well, you need to have a clear understanding of the information systems and the possible threats that they are likely to face. And we all know that information systems uh, actually encompasses the information technology infrastructure plus the people and the procedure. Okay, Abigail, your hand is up, Abigail. Okay, thank you, yes, Doc. Please, I would like to ask in developing the document and the procedure, um, in case there's a damage on the system that demands that a part of it must be purchased, um, do they include that in, in, in the document? Uh, Abigail, sorry, I didn't hear that. Can you say it again? Um, um, Doc, please, in developing the document and then the procedures, um, in case there's yes. a damage on the system, that demands that a, part okay. of, that a part of it must be purchased because maybe it's broken beyond something that can be um, rectified yeah. um, immediately. And yes. um, do they have to include that in the document and the procedures? Yeah, so that one is actually part of business continuity plan. And we will look at that one too. Okay. So when when it when incident is, we are talking about only incident at the moment. Okay. So sometimes certain issues, what you will classify as an incident may not be an incident, it may have escalated. In this case, it is no longer the, in the hands of incident response team. It now okay. goes into the disaster recovery. So okay. in the disaster recovery, that is where you now, the disaster has okay already. There's a flood. Our, our building has, has bent down and everything is gone. So how do we recover and then ensure continuity of our business? Then so disaster recovery and business continuity come together. That is why I made mention that we have something called hot sites and then a warm site and then cold site. So business ensuring continuity must ensure that uh, 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 planning for continuity must ensure that they have deep, a site ev uh, elsewhere. Site is a business continuity plan. So that mm -hmm. when it happens, then they're quickly moving there and then the business continues. As to whether it is why it's hot, why it's warm, and why it's cold, I will explain it when we get to B BCP. Okay. But yes, it has to be part of the plan, but rather as part of the BCP. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Thank you very much for the question. Yes, uh, I like this way. Uh, I think there was one other. Huh, okay, so Omani is saying that. Can you please throw more lights on the test and revision of contingency plans? Because it occurs to me that most organizations don't test for contingencies, exceptionally with regards to natural disaster. You need to test it. For instance, uh, you go for a backup and then your system, your, you take, let's take a simple like an example. You have developed a plan. And the plan is that uh, when there is an incident, the incident has to be reported to a secretary and that secretary will issue tickets. These are all procedure I'm, I'm describing. Issue ticket to where the complaint came from. Then this, this uh, secretary has to refer to a particular department uh, maybe the, the security department, this issue has happened. Now, maybe within the procedure, you do not actually spell out exactly who they should be referred to. Or you may have spelled out that it should refer to the head of that unit, the head of that unit. And then the head of that unit will now look for someone to handle or to go and handle the issue. Now, in, you need to test this process. You need to test this procedure. Let us assume that someone has actually uh, uh, complained about an incident. It goes to the secretary, how effective it is. You can, you, you can test it by using a, a business continuity plan, uh, sorry, a, a, a business process improvement. So the secretary reported this to the, uh, sorry, the person reported to the secretary, the secretary issued the kit. Then, uh, the secretary referred this one to, let's say, the security department, the head of the security. 
And then maybe one, maybe one he was referring or he referred to it, and the head of the security is in a meeting. And meanwhile, it's an emergency. Maybe there is an intrusion. Someone is intruding into the system. This is an emergency. So, and it, it, this it case is referred to that person. The person is in the meeting or is not even there because of his responsibility. What happened? And uh, to end up, so maybe the, point, the procedure is saying that he's the only person you can refer to. And that's it. So you need to test to see whether the procedure or the processes is very effective. So if there's a problem, for instance, you refer to the person and the head of the, the head of that department is probably in the meeting or he has another issues and is not able to address this as quickly as possible, then you can now begin to think around it and say that, okay, why not referring this one to three or four people within that setup so that when the case, uh, when this kind of incident you know, comes up, at least one of them can quickly respond and then we can have this thing resolved. You know, things like that. So your procedure and the steps that you develop for it, you need to test it. You need to test it. And even it, it may also, uh, you may also even be guided by a policy. You may have an email policy that when the case happens, don't call, send an email, maybe a policy guiding it, you know, and all these things needs, you need to test it in real time to see whether, you know, <laughs> it is effective when there's an incident. Okay. Uh, Abigail, your hand is up. All right, so I was saying that the person must have knowledge in information systems and then its functional areas. So each member, yeah, so each member of the incidents response team must know his or her role, specific role. Now, usually when I'm teaching this, I try to be very uh, careful on uh, the generality of these kind of uh, these components, because some companies or some firms are very small. You have small and then medium firms, and of course you have uh, bigger firms. So unlike the where I said you may have you must you must have a contingency plan, uh, you have the incident response team, the disaster recovery team, and then also business continuity team. With a bigger firm like EcoBank, you know, Commercial Bank and all that, it is prudent. They have all these teams in place to handle uh, contingencies. But when you have your small firm, you know, your small business where the number of people are 10, they are 15, you know, you cannot have all these in place. You just have only one team, but make sure that the team is effective and develop a good strategy in handling contingencies. So in effect, uh, this is to look at the broader picture and also uh, the bigger settings. And also work in concert with each other. Then you work with each other. If you are in the same team, make sure that you work together when there's an issue. And then one, one of you has knowledge when it comes to security, uh, handling network security. And then uh, another person has knowledge in terms of handling uh, data security then the issue comes and it has to, you have to combine this knowledge. The two of you need to collaborate effectively in order to solve the problem. And then uh, execute objectives of the incident response uh, plan. Okay, now let's look at uh, incident detection. Uh, now we are talking about detection of an incident. So how do you even detect it when incident is coming? So the challenge actually for this incident response team sometimes is to determine whether the event, that event is a routine system use or an actual incident. Sometimes you may use the system. You know, you know, we all use laptops and some other devices, you know, our mobile phones. Sometimes you use the mobile phone to, the, to, to, to some extent where the mobile phone will even freeze. When it freezes, uh, usually it is because you have loaded so many uh, programs or you have, you have opened so many applications when you load a lot of applications and then put a lot of pictures and all that, it can somehow even freeze your mobile phone, even our laptops and all that. So system to the extent that uh, it has taken a lot of, you know, the system memory and space and also the processor is also overwhelmed. So the system tend to freeze. So such is just a routine system use. And then when it is an actual incident, 
So usually a problem with IRT, when there's a trigger, uh, someone in the operation wrong with the system. Now, when there is a response in camp, now they need to they need to find out whether this issue is actually a routine system use or an incident response, uh, incident, an actual incident. So it is usually a problem. If you don't make the right decision, if you don't get the, the right person to make the right decision at that time, you may assume that it is a routine system use. And when you assume it's a routine system, start the machine. Maybe the problem is not routine system use. It's rather a natural incident. Someone is actually in and the person is in the process before you realize the person to hijack and then the it will not escalate to a disaster. So usually the team they have challenge actual is the incident is an actual incident they now classify what kind of it is it's the process of incident whether or not constitute an actual incident, team system use or an actual incident. So once it's an actual from the user's intrusion detection systems, host the network-based virus detection software, system administrator, all ways to track and detect incident candidates. Basically, uh, here is that uh, these softwares, apart from the end user, let's say the teller, who is using the ma machine saying that his system is freezing. Another way to solve in uh, most of the business organization or the business systems have this software called it the intrusion detection system. There are a number of systems. Uh, the intrusion detection system will now trigger that there's an intrusion and that one can also trigger a response. Then host and also network-based virus detection software. Of course, we have uh, antivirus or softwares or viruses that are also designed or developed in order to track uh, or to detect things like um, viruses, worms, and all the malwares. Then the system administrators are always tracked. Of course, we also have a system administrator. The system administrator are also at the back end. They track the system log. For instance, if someone logs into the system today, uh, the system log will say that maybe in Nigeria, someone has logged into the system at this time and every software comes with a system log. So the system administrator may also realize or see that the system has been logged in or someone has actually entered into the system in Nigeria. And if you don't expect anyone to log into your system, in Nigeria, then you can trigger that that someone there is some there's an intrusion from Nigeria or somewhere else. So the system administrator can also report, the end users can report. You can have a software also on the system that can help also detect. And also uh, you have uh, uh, antiviruses also installed on our system. We are looking at actually detection anyway. So careful training allows everyone to rely on vital information, a uh, relay vital information to the IR team. So the end users need to be well trained. Then they tell us what constitutes uh, an incident, uh, potential incident, or actual incident, so that the person will report. Your organization must have these software intrusion detection software running on the system that can also help if there's an intrusion. And of course, you have the host and network based virus detection software and also the system administrators. They all need to receive proper training so that when it happens, they can trigger that. Now let's look at uh, possible indicators of uh, incidents. Then we look at probable, probable ones and then definite indicators. Look at the definite ind indicators, for instance. Use of dormant accounts. You have an account assigned to someone. The person, yes, he doesn't even use the account. But all of a sudden, you realize that the account is being used. This 
to raise some sort of uh, question mark. Changes to the locks, where I did explain that the system administrator realized that there is changes. Someone is intruding. You see, one funny thing about hackers or crackers <laughs> is that when they are in, when they are penetrating or they are entering into a system, the first thing they do is that they try to go into the system lock first and then cover their tracks. They make it in such a way that the system lock is not able to track them. So the first target is to go to the system lock. For instance, SQL injection, for instance. SQL injection is something that can easily be detected once there's a system administrator monitoring the system all the time. Because of course you, you use SQL injection to go in, but uh, it depends, anyway, it depends on the script. Some of the script are in such a way that it will blur the log. Otherwise, you know, it will, the log will record that there has been some sort of intrusion into the system. So hackers, first of all, will try to close the log so that the log will not track them that they have someone has entered into the system from here. Once they, once they succeed here, then they can now start to do what they want to do with the system. So presence of hacker tools and the notification, when you realize that, you know, you know there are certain softwares or there are tools that uh, you can, that aids in terms of hacking. And then when you see such tools, uh, it is also a way to suspect that uh, there is someone uh, intruding into the system. The identification of a partner up here, maybe someone a uh, whistleblower or someone within the same firm who can be an employee and then Let's have possible indicators. Uh, presence of unfamiliar files. You are always with the system and you know how the system works. But all of a sudden, you realize that there's some files that are highly unfamiliar to you. So it is a probable kind of intrusion that is coming. Then, presence of execution of unknown programs. You know, sometimes uh, you may own your system and you realize that you have a program that automatically open. And it happens a lot, especially those of us who like to download from this torrent site. Torrent program application that is embedded in a movie. So once we have that on your system, you realize that all of a sudden the hardware or the, the, the application itself tend to install or to install at the back end without your knowledge. And sometimes when you have hardware and those softwares, uh, hackers are able to use it and then uh, make your machine like a zombie machine and they use it to do denial of service attack. So these are possible indicators and uh, probable indicators. So if you are a trainer in terms of cyber security and security issues, uh, your organization, all workers there, you need, to have, you need to take them through some of the possible indicators, you know, probable and definite indicators of uh, intrusion so that they know when such thing is happening, then they can now report that something is happening. Any question? Any question? No, sir. Any comment? No, sir. Okay, Ahmed, Ahmed. Yes, sir. Um, going back to the incident indicators, I don't see any social engineering as part of uh, the indicators. Okay, you see, social engineering is, is not too technical. It's not a technical component of incidents. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, somehow you can find a way to handle social engineering, but social engineering is actually uh, uh, manipulating someone's behavior, you know, manipulating behaviors. And actually those incidents, you know, these are just some of them, you know, there are, you have more than this. These are some of them. But <clears throat> social engineering is just about manipulating a behavior. Uh, it's not a technical thing. For instance, where you have hackers, you know, <clears throat> crackers intruding into a system and all that, 
and also you know but social engineering is like you know manipulating your behavior i'll come to you and tell you that uh, i'm selling a car or let's say uh, uh, i mistakenly transfer whatever money into your wife Whatever, you know, that kind of behavior that is going on in Ghana, people manipulating people's behavior. He will tell you that he has mistakenly transferred money into your Momo account and then do this, and then you'll find a way to get your credential, sometimes your PIN. And then, uh, so he will just manipulate you to divulge certain things or divulge your secrecy to him. So that is actually a social engineering. Uh, somebody, uh, there's this. Uh, Funny, funny videos. Once I watch, you know, there was one funny video that I watch. This boy, uh, someone called the mom's phone, and the boy, picked, the boy picked the phone. Then the guy asks that uh, if he can, if the mother is there, and he said the mother is there, and then uh, he asks whether he has access to the mother's, you know, uh, visa card. And the boy said yes, he has the access to the visa card. They ask the boy to. The mother has a problem with the bank and they want to fix the problem, blah, 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 blah. If they don't fix the problem, the mother is going to have a serious issue and the mother, the, the mother may even lose all his money and all that. So the boy should take the mother's card and read out the pin on the card and then the, the CVC at the back. So the boy, to, whether he's a boy or a man, he looks like a boy, but he's a man. And then uh, he was playing around. So is he, is he, he's trying to, I mean, uh, manipulate the behavior just to get the secret details. So that's social engineering. Uh, uh, Isa uh, Ahmed. Yes, sir. Yeah, that, that's yes. fine, sir. Yes, thank you, sir. Oh, uh, you were the one who asked the question. Yes, sir. I, I was the one who asked. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Your hand is still up, so I talk. Oh, yeah. Okay. So occurrence of actual. So when there is actual incident, you know, uh, there's a there's a likelihood of uh, loss of availability. You remember we did this, the integrity and also confidentiality. Then the the also violation of uh, policy, the violation of the law. So when there is incident, the policy is violated and also the law within the firm is also violated. And uh, availability is lost, integrity of the data is also lost, and then the data is not no longer confidential because unauthorized access has come in to stay. Now let's look at, uh, we are still looking at the incident uh, response. We have, we, 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 we just finished with the detection. Let's look at the incident response. So one an actual, once an actual incident has, has been confirmed and properly classified. So now you classify that this one is an actual incident. So what do you do next? So the team moves from detection phase. Now they move on to a phase called reaction phase. Because they now they've been able to detect that this one is an incident. It's not a routine system. It's an incident. So now they have to react. So in the incident response phase, a number of action steps taken by the incident response uh, response team and others must occur quickly. It may occur concurrently. You remember I said two team members or the team members must work together. So one maybe the issue may be data uh, list list with uh, data list with network. And this person is good at network and this person is good at data issues. So the two of them must work together to have this problem resolved. So, and sometimes the problem may be resolved concurrently. While this one is doing handling the network aspect, this person will be handling the data aspect. And then the things that needs to be done is one, notification of key personnel. Of course, once you move from the detection phase, you need to notify key personnel. You remember I said, if the incident is reported to a secretary, so he has to now uh, get key personnel who are actually part of the incident response team to go and handle it. And of course, the assignment of the tax and the doc documentation of the incident. And every incident, you need to document it so that in future, uh, you, analyze the, you analyze it and in future you can uh, handle any issues that you couldn't handle it well in the first incident. Okay, aha. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mufat. The name of the animation is called Tigolo. Yes, Tigolo. Yes, Tigolo. Good. So now we look at notification of key personnel. 
or you're in a department where you suspect based on the training that you have received in terms of incidents, how do you handle it? How do you notify the key personnel? So we have a terminology called alert rooster. Every organization must have alert rooster. And then I will ask, I will still ask the class, do you have alert rooster in your offices? Uh, recently, UGBS developed an alert rooster. Uh, unfortunately, they did not actually give it to every lecturer, but they, they would rather paste it in uh, some key strategic places. So it's just a document containing contact information, numbers of individuals to be notified. So for instance, if you are a personnel manager, you are using a system, you should have a list of all the people, uh, you know, all the list of you know, people who are likely to solve your problem for you. You have their contact numbers, their emails and all that, their telephone numbers, so that when there's an incident, you quickly call. Or there could be the secretary. Organization may have only one number to the secretary to the incident response team, call the person and then alert the person that you know uh, you suspect this, and then uh, if it can be taken care of. Then you have other key personnel, you know, must also be notified only after incident has, has been confirmed. So once you are you manage to be able to classify this one is actual incident. Uh, other other personnel must also be notified. Uh, but before media and other external sources, for instance, the senior management, you know, the board, they must all be notified when it has been confirmed that it's an incident. But you need the key personnel first. You get them notified, let them attend to you, let them handle the issue. And if it's a big issue or the issue is so big, then you later on you need to now notify the key the, the top management and of course sometimes the external you know uh, sources may also come external the, the media and all that may also come to get information they need to also be notified uh, something like you know imagine that uh, national is it NIA? i don't know whether i'm that national identification authority imagine that their data is is compromised uh, yeah, could you realize that you say it again. Hello. So imagine that National Education Authority has their data compromise. You see that there's a lot of interest, we a lot of interest from the media and also other people. So but within, you know, the issue has to be handled within first. And then better still, or I always recommend that the issue, if it is an incident. Uh, if you handle it after it has been handled and everything is in order, then you can now alert the media. Uh, some it, depending on the situation, you may not even alert the media, but you know sometimes someone within will definitely bring it out uh, and all that. But that is why sometimes when you are take to work in organization, they ask you to sign non-disclosure agreements. So some of these things you are you are binded not to disclose it unless, of course. Uh, the proper channel is used to let it out. So, and then after the incident has been handled in a way, there's a need to document it. You need to have a document, uh, what happened. So as soon as an incident has been confirmed and an education process is underway, the team should begin documentation. First of all, who, record who, what, when, where, how, why, each of the action taken while the incident is occurring. And even after the incident has been handled, you need to still have a proper documentation. So documentation serves, serves as a case study after the fact to determine if the right action were taken and if they were effective. Like I said, for future, you know, sick, you need to have it documented, how it started, you know, who, and then uh, what was the problem after the issue, after the investigation, you realize that one of the workers compromised his or her credential. That is why the system was attacked. All those needs to be recorded in a document for future uh, issues. Now, and then the next is also containment. Of course, after the documentation that you have to now find measures to contain it. But like I said, documentation doesn't end here. Documentation also continues after even the containment strategy. So essential task of IR is to stop the incident or contain its impact. So incident containment strategy focus on two tasks. 
first, you stop the incident, and secondly, you recover, recover control of the system. So you have stopped it, but you need to also have a control of the system. So these are some of the uh, IT must stop. Uh, some of the strategies to contain incidents. You know, once it happens that it is reported, these are the first thing you, I would say like more than like first eight. So incident response team can stop the incident and attempt to recover control by means of several strategies. One of them is one, disconnect affected communication circuits. If it has to do with the communication channel. Dynamically apply filtering rules to limit certain types of network access. And those of you who are into network, you can filter, you can even stop some of the system from not even working at all. You can even take them from the network by using filtering techniques. So you can do that. Right now, even TableNet, TableNet has, okay, uh, Renos, I'll come to you. TableNet, I don't know whether some of you are in TableNet. TableNet, you can even go to that admin and then filter it. Uh, you maybe uh, you have certain devices or someone is using your, your system. You can go in there and even filter, take the person's machine, Mac, Mac, uh, the machine, uh, what we call the Mac number from the table net. The person cannot even use your network again. Uh, Renos. Yes, sir. Renos. So, uh, I would, yes. yes, I would want to ask a question. So um, in an instance where there's been an attack on a system, and then um, in, an instance, in, a, in an instance where there has been an attack on a system, and then okay. uh, your, in your investigations, you have concluded that there has been some impact on, um, the attack has brought up some impact, and then yes. this impact has also affected individuals. Um, okay. How do you communicate this to? The, it, okay, let me put it this way. Is it advisable to communicate it to the affected individuals? And if it is, how do we communicate it to the individuals? Uh, I don't know whether I get you right. Are you talking about issues of like risk? You know, we have, with all this, we have what we call risk management. So if the problem happens because of you, then there is a team, you know, risk management team that will also psych you. Or oh, you mean, uh, I don't get your question very well. Can you formulate the question? I think you are you are also far away, so I can't hear you well. Reynolds, can you uh, frame the question again? Uh, please, did you hear him? Maybe someone may want to. Uh, yes, Ahmed. Yes, sir. His question is gone off. So what, what, yeah, what was the question? Yes. Okay, I, I think if I heard him right, I think he was talking about um, maybe in case there is uh, an incident, and then okay. who who is uh, who who do you report to? Do you report to the the data owner or the information owner or an incident manager or sort of? That's how I understood mm -hmm. it. Okay, you know, I made mention that uh, it depends on every organization their structure and the procedure in handling an incident. So if there's an incident response team, usually the team has a secretary, maybe someone within the security setup who is working as a secretary for the incident response. And then he's always working because in all the various departments, when there's an incident, and the incident is not only limited to information uh, system security. <coughs> Others as well, it could be hardware incident and all that. So uh, if this person works in the operational department like a teller and is having a problem with the system, the system has freezed. Based on the training that he has received, he suspects that it's, a, it's an incident. It's not a routine system use, it's an incident. Or even if it's a routine system, he has to still report it. He takes a phone from the rooster where we have all the contacts of the key personnels in the organization. He will call the secretary. In the, in the personnel 
uh, let's say in the marketing department, where my machine is this and that and that and that, this and that and that. And this person would quickly relay or select appropriate departments. It has to do with hard, hard, hardware. And hardware, someone from the hardware department who is part of the incident response team has to be communicated to. And then the person will be asked to probably go and find out what is happening. And then that is why I'm saying at this stage, once you are able to identify and confirm that this is really an incident, that you need to now take certain strategies. Now, one of the strategies to take is that if the problem has to do with, let's say, communication, you may have to disconnect the affected communication circuit. That's one strategy. Then we are talking about filtering of machines. Maybe the machine itself on the network. You don't have to stop every machine working. You can filter by taking out uh, that machine from the network using Mac filtering technique. You can also disable compromised user accounts. For instance, I have University of Ghana user accounts. If my user account is compromised because the person, someone has been able to use my credentials to log into the University of Ghana account, quickly, my user account should be disabled. So for instance, the person who will go there to find out and confirm the incident, he has to now connect to the appropriate department, the, the system administrator, tell the system administrator he should do system uh, mark filtering and take out this machine out of the network. So they are like first aid. Then you temporarily disable compromised process of services. So all those places that are affected, you need to disable or take them out temporarily. Take down the conduit application or a server. Even if the server is having a problem, take it down as quick as possible because that one is seriously affected. You must shut it down and stop all computers and network, de uh, network devices. But in an event where all the system is seriously affected, even if you shut it down, it does not stop anything. For instance, your data has been hijacked. You cannot do anything, it has been hijacked. It is not at the incident level. It has now escalated now to a disaster level. There is a flood. Your building has actually bent down. A serious flood. All your machines are spoiled. Everything is gone. This is no longer an incident. This is a, what do you call it, a disaster. Thomas. Yes, sir. Um, please, the other component of the question uh, was that situation where after going through um, the process, you identify that maybe personnel X was the cause of the incident. Okay. How would you be able to record that? Or let's say, tell the person that you did X, Y, Z, and that caused this particular incident. How, what is the process in communicating that to the, that particular person? All right, so All right. of course, you see, uh, you know, incidents, when the incident is happening, you need to attend to it quickly and make sure that everything is in place. After you are able to contain the incident, the next thing is investigation. There must be an investigation why this thing happened. So when you want to investigate, you may go into the system log and you realize that uh, maybe uh, a teller X, this person called X. So we say X credentials was used to log in into the system. So an X credential was used to log into the system, but not in Ghana, but rather in the UK. Meaning that your credentials has been compromised for whatever reason. There could be the possibility that you were caught up in system that led you to compromise it. So the investigation, you may be invited you know, by a team through the investigation, ask questions about places you've been to, what you've done, what, where you have, what you have done with your credentials, you know, how you've been using your system, you know, things like that. So eventually, if they are able to establish that the problem came from you, and then for some reason you did you were careless in a way that your credentials were compromised for the person to use to attack the system, then you the, the next thing to do is that they will refer you to risk management department. 
risk management department play the role in psyching you psychologically and then prepare you well. Uh, if the, the investigation arrives that compromise your credentials was a deliberate attempt, deliberate, it is possible that you did it, you did that deliberately for money, or you did that deliberately just to be able to end something. In this case, you'll be fired, and of course, you may be referred to law enforcement agency like the police, and then uh, it, you'll be taken on, maybe the law court and all that, and you, can, you will be seriously punished. But if the investigation arrives that uh, the, you were actually caught up in a situation unaware, or the problem, even though it is your credential that was compromised, but the investigation arrived that it happened without your knowledge. So it is not intentional. So as a result, you'll be referred to risk management department, then you'll be signed in a way. And then of course, more training will be given to you so that next time you'll be more careful about it. Have I answered the question? Emmanuel. Yes, sir. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, but, but you, yes, Emmanuel. Yes, um, Doc, uh, I want to take this opportunity and understand this question. I don't know if a network can be compromised uh, na nationally. You don't know whether a network can be compromised nationally? Yes, please. Uh, if you say a network can be compromised nationally, uh, how? Especially this uh, network uh, providers. Okay, well, in that case, yes, of course it can, uh, especially uh, even, I think last year or last two years, uh, our, uh, was it compromised? No, it wasn't compromised, but of course it can, but it wasn't compromised. Oh, can you, or do we say compromised? Anyway, there was a problem with the, with the you know, the internet, for instance, we, we don't get it from Ghana. That is why internet is very expensive here in Africa. Uh, so it, 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 you know, mostly fiber, fiber optics, you know, it is under the sea. And of course they give it to then the ISP, internet service providers receives. And then of course they, they, they give us the data or whatever we need. So uh, recently one of the cables, I think was it last year or last two years, under sea cable, one of them, under, yes, under sea cable. One of them was, had a problem. I don't know whether it was an MTN. And the whole Ghana, I think our MTN wasn't working. Do you remember that? Uh, I have one friend, one of my PhD students, uh, Gilbert, one brilliant guy, uh, Gilbert Mombaza. He's a, he's a senior engineer at MTN. So I called him to find out what happened. And he explained that there was a problem with the undersea under cable. Uh, somehow, uh, there was a, he said a problem, whether it was, Compromise what I said, there was a problem. So that is that one affected, is one of the cables. So it affected, you know, the network uh, providing. And the whole Ghana, I think the whole Ghana, we had, we experienced that challenge. So it was just under sea cable. And I know maybe some of you here are already working with, you know, uh, this kind of, okay, so Isifu, Isifu, you may want to say, yeah, Isifu, take the floor. Then after that, Abigail will now, uh, okay, Doc, also, uh, I want yes. to ask a question. Uh, yes. In my environment, let's say you continually experience a persistent type of incident. Let's say, okay. uh, for example, a traffic from your environment always communicate with the uh, anonymization services. Does, do you consider that mm -hmm. as an incident or it becomes a, a disaster? Uh, say it again. Person? You mean a traffic... You mean a traffic from where? From your environment, continually uh, communicating with an anonymization service or a malware sign, continually. Oh, so continually. That yes. That in this case, has it become, is it still an incident or is moved from the space of incident to a disaster? Yeah, the, we see uh, one thing is that uh, uh, with a disaster, it is also characterized by the impact. Yes. It's characterized by the impact. So if uh, the traffic, of course, when there's traffic, does it make the system slow? Yes. So if you make the system slow, I think that uh, at this stage, I wouldn't say that it is disaster. It is still within the incident level because you can stop it. Okay. You can, you can stop it. Okay. 
So I don't, it's not, and then the, the, like I said, the, the disaster, disaster aspect is characterized by the impact. Sometimes when it is a disaster, uh, you need to bring in backups and then bring in the business continuity plan to ensure your business continuity. So this time round, even though the system is slow because of the traffic, and mostly this traffic is caused by this uh, denial of service attack, mostly the, uh, distributed design of service attack. And I think that as it's somewhere in this lecture, uh, I will use the denial of service attack to differentiate between incidents and also uh, uh, disaster. When it is distributed denial of service attack, it is no longer an incident. It's actually uh, a disaster. But when it is just uh, a denial of service attack, but not distributed, that one can easily be taken care of. And that one is incident, uh, incident recovery. Abigail. Abigail. Yes, Doc. Yes. And Doc, please, I would like to ask um, something. There, there was this incident where a bank was hacked and huge sum of money was extorted from it. So could it be that their system um, are not complex enough to secure um, their data? Or it could be that the hackers were able to disable and um, they, they disabled the a system log in order not to detect um, the source. Okay, you see, you see, sometimes <laughs> information technology, when I'm teaching anything concerning IT, software engineering, security, and all that, I'm very much, I'm very, very particular about what I see. Uh, the, uh, the, the whole system, our information systems, was developed by a human being. And the same human being who also developed tools that can be used to hack into a system. And it is the same human being that also monitor the system to ensure that there is no intrusion. So if it, if it happened that way, there's a possibility that yes, the system was robust, but someone, has uh, has been able to outsmart the system in order to get into it. So sometimes that is why you know you must always be alert at all times, so that when it is happening, it should remain an incident, but not escalating to a disaster. Look, no matter how robust the system is. No matter how strong the system is, there are people who are so good that they can still be able to somehow access the system without authorization. But one way to be able to contain some of these things, that's what I'm saying, you, you should anticipate. One way to be able to contain some of these challenges is to be on, on it 24 seven. Monitoring, using intrusion detection software, monitoring the system, system administrators also monitoring the system. And you also have a skilled person who is an ethical hacker also monitoring the system. So that when it happens, you treat it as an incident rather than allowing it escalate into disaster. Okay, uh, Thank you, Doug. Yes, could you? Doug, thank you. Uh, uh, the answer you gave to Muglu's question uh, got me a little bit confused. You know, initially I was thinking uh, incidents are relative. So the impact on one uh, company, the same impact on two companies, and one may see it in a different light than the other. So to conclude, if it's a disaster, uh, will be, uh, I don't know, if jumping again. And also, I want to also ask, you know, incidents, can they be levels? No, but I, I think that I didn't conclude that it's a disaster, did I? Or... And I heard you saying that if they may have lost a lot, then uh, that will be a disaster or something. I said, okay, well, maybe I said uh, it is characterized by the impact. And sometimes, when the issue, uh, the issue can be to the extent that even the businesses cannot run at all, 
that is why I use the word denial of service attack and also distributed denial of service attack. And I said, this one is mostly incident and this one is disaster. When there's a denial of service attack, the system, even the, those, those service areas or those sectors may not even function at all. It will not even work at all because the system is so choked that even when you click on a button, it will take like one year before it opens. But when it's just a mere denial, denial of service attack, the system may be functioning even though it is slow. But this one, it's a disaster. It's no longer an incident. But here, when, it, when, it, when the traffic is actually flooded and it is slow, yes, they can still be using even though it is slow. It is an incident and you can quickly rush to it and then rectify the situation. But when it is denied, when it's distributed and then it escalates in a way, it is no longer an incident, it's, it's a disaster. And I think that is here. I will explain that one here. I will use this diagram to explain the difference. Anyway, move on with your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, the second one is, uh, is it okay to have, uh, let's say, categories in incidents? Let's say the imp impact is critical, is severe, is uh, medium or, or such things. Yes, 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 yes. You see, one way, uh, when you are documenting, depending on organization, it is always nice to also develop your own strategy to categorize it or maybe, or maybe rank it. <laughs> the incident level, maybe, well, it depends on organization. Like I said, I'm actually taking this one in a general perspective. You can decide to have a classification, maybe incident level one, level two, level three. So if it has to do with uh, uh, just a mere uh, freezing or not freezing, maybe the machine being slow, maybe just a mere uh, virus that came from the internet to make the machine slow. All you need to do is to just get antivirus to scan and then the system works. You may classify that one as a uh, low, the impact is very low incident, you know, but when it's, it's also, a situation whereby you know the system lock there's changing the system lock meaning that you suspect someone is actually intruding that you quickly you know handle the person maybe the, the machine that has been intruded you just cut off or you take the machine off and then handle the issue so you see that this one may be a bit higher than just the first one you know you can have your own way of class classifying it is a form of also document so it is up to you uh, the incident response yes it can be done that way <laughs> Ah, uh, Kudu, your name, your other name is, how do you pronounce it? Gamo. 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 Okay, I, I Gamo, yeah, yeah. I, I know someone who's called uh, Chamo, he's called Chamo, Chamo. Oh, okay. Uh, my last question. Yeah, so, uh, okay, go on. So, uh, an incident is not recoverable. Uh, how do you handle that? Or how do you term it? So you if it is not recoverable, it's no longer an incident. Now it becomes a disaster. Okay. So Do you understand? Because if it is an incident comes and you realize that this one you cannot handle it, or it is a problem. Once it escalates, once the system, uh, I was given an example of when a data you realize that someone is log log in, then uh, you quickly shut out the machine. When you are able to, you maybe you turn off the machine again and you realize that uh, the person who was logging in couldn't succeed. Handled fine, but let's say you all of a sudden you realize that you know the log system has changed, but your data has been hijacked, meaning that at that instant you cannot recover the system because your data has been hijacked, and then you are finding it difficult to recover it. Maybe if not hijacked as such, maybe it has even been copied or taken, and then this one protected, and you cannot access it. So here it is no longer. Uh, an incident again, it's now a disaster. So now you have to trigger a disaster team with a disaster strategy to handle it. Sometimes it may be around somewhere, you know, someone has now hijacked this one, pay this amount of money, then I release it. So here it is now a disaster. You need to now put in disaster recovery strategy to be able to get your data back. Whether you have to go and pay the money or whatever, it depends on the strategy that you put in place to handle that. Frederick, we are saying. So then, why do you call it uh, uh, disaster recovery if it's not unrecoverable? No, but you said, I thought the beginning you were talking of uh, the incident. You said incident. 
if you yes. did all you did is yes, the disaster at, at the disaster level. And at the disaster level, we are to recover. And now yes. uh, uh, it, it, it seems unrecoverable. So I want to find if it's un unrecoverable. Okay. <laughs> okay, so but you see the issue is that sometimes you look at the uh the the, the pronouns or let's say the dominant aspect. If it is an incident and it's not recoverable, usually the, the organization of the firm will not even exist again. The organization of the firm will collapse. It collapse. If you, for instance, imagine that your whole data, you are running a bank and your whole data is hijacked and then there's no way you can recover it. They say you come and pay ransom, so you don't have the money to do that. And you see, eventually your, your business will even collapse. It do not even work. But mostly you are able to recover. Sometimes if it is a flood, you know, flood for instance, disaster, you can recover it. That's why you have, let's say, you have the business continuity plan in place. Uh, you have a hot site. So once there's a flood and the whole building collapse or whatever, you move into the hot site. The hot site is like a, a copy of the rear site. So you move into the hot site. The data is backed in the hot site. Everything, whatever you have here is also at the hot site. So quickly you move into the hot site and your business continues. And then uh, if it's also sometimes the damage may be severe in a way that uh, you have backups to be able to handle it. Some of them, it will be difficult to recover it entirely. But when, 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 it can, when, it, when it's a situation whereby you cannot even recover it at all, the, the probability that your, your business may even collapse is very high. So uh, like I said, you look at the pronouns or the dominant aspect of it. In most cases, you're able to make the recovery. If you are not able to recover, I can tell you that about 90% of those firms doesn't even continue again, it collapses. Frederick. Yes, sir. Um, I, li so I, li I, like, I like your questions. Uh, who asked those questions? Was it uh, uh, Kudu? Uh, Kudu, yeah, Kudu. Okay, uh, Frederick. Yeah, mine is um, a contribution on the question Kudu asked regarding prioritizing, yeah. prioritizing um, incidents. So I want to share what we do in the organization I work. So for us, um, for us, we have, when a user reports an incident, we have um, five classification of the incident or prioritization to the incident. So we have five, four, three, two, one, five being the lowest um, priority we attach to the incident and then one being the highest priority. So depending on the severity of the incident the person is reporting, then you place a call to the service desk and then they will upgrade the priority attached to the tickets that you are afraid. So for example, if um, let's say the whole of the country cannot assess a system or there is a breach in any of the system, that will qualify for um, tickets priority too. But then if it is the whole group um, globally, then we escalate that to priority one. So depending on the severity, then we have different categorizations that we give to the, the tickets that you raise. And then it also um, attracts the response to to the ticket resolution based on the priority we assign to it. So there are SLAs which are agreed at each priority level. Priority one definitely will go be not more than three hours to resolve such incidents. So that's why we hardly choose a higher priority to a ticket. Okay, to add to that, you see, even us, sometimes you may uh, subscribe to a services, either in the bank, uh, insurance companies, or what have you. Let's say you have, a, you have a problem. You call them and say that uh, this is your problem. Somebody picks the call. You narrate your problem to the person and the person will say, okay, we will attend to you. So as soon as you narrate all your issues to them, they now assign the priority levels. Whether this one is a priority that, that needs to be handled now. Sometimes you see that you make a complaint and it will take like a week for them to handle it because it's not a priority to them. Sometimes you call to make a complaint uh, and then within some few hours or some few seconds, and the issue, the issue is handled. For instance, if I just call to say that I have transferred money from an account to another account, and the money has not gone through, this one is not in high priority as compared to calling to say that uh, my card, I've misplaced my Visa card, or my Visa card, suspect that my Visa card is being compromised. So once you 
complain about your visa card, within the shortest possible time, they have to block that visa card in order to stop whoever is having it in uh, assessing or maybe taking money from your account. So usually some of these issues are, are handled out. But you know, what we are looking at is internal. So with the internal you know, processes in terms of security and all that. Good, thank you very much uh, for the contribution. Okay, so now uh, after the discovery processes, you know, these are the processes to go through. Uh, once, there's, uh, once the extent of the damage has been identified, I think that I said once the incident has been contained, control, okay. Uh, okay, so recovery process. Once the, uh, once the extent of the damage has been determined, the recovery process begins. Identify and resolve vulnerability that allowed incidents to occur and spread. Address, install, and replace, upgrade, or safeguard the field that field to stop or limit the incident. Sorry. Okay, I, I think I, I, I missed this part uh, here. An incident may increase in scope or severity to the point that incident response plan cannot adequately contain the incident. Each organization will have to determine during the business impact analysis, the point at which the incident becomes a disaster. So the organization must also uh, document when to involve outside response. So when it becomes a disaster, you now have to put steps in recovering it. If you're not able to recover it, then uh, like I said, the tendency that your organization will keep on is very low. Okay, so initiating is a recovery. Yeah, let me, let me just a minute, let me clean some of these. I think I've written a lot on this. All right, so we continue. So once the incident has been contained, the system control again, incident recovery can begin. So incident recovery team must assess full extent of damage in order to determine what must be done to restore the systems. Immediate determination of the scope of the breach of confidentiality, integrity and availability of information, information asset is called incident damage assessment. Those who document the damage must be trained to collect and preserve evidence in case the incident is part of crime or results in a civil action. So it is very important when it comes to documentation. Then the recovery process. Uh, sorry, I need to also clean this a bit. Uh, I think I'm writing a lot. Okay, so once the extent of the damage has been determined, the recovery process begins. So you identify and resolve vulnerabilities that allowed incidents to occur and spread. So uh, maybe the, the vulnerability was as a result of one of the employees who made a mistake and then uh, someone, a hacker used him as a weak link to assess and cause problem in the system. So you address, you install and replace or aggressive gas that fail to stop or limit the incident or are missing from the system in the first place. Then you evaluate monitoring capabilities present to improve detection and reporting methods and install new monitoring capabilities such as detection intrusion systems and all that. Okay, now let's look at after action review, we call it AAR. So before returning to routine duties, the incident recovery team must conduct after action review. I think I've said this over and over. We are still within the incident recovery stage. So at that stage, you know, everything is done. First of all, you need to now review. So the, the revision also includes even the investigation that you do to find out the root cause of it. And then the team members review their actions. In the process, what was your actions? Did your action actually serve a good purpose? You identify the areas where the IR plan worked, didn't work, and should also improve. So this may actually uh, uh, trigger whether the procedure for incidents recovery should be modified or not. So it's very important you can improve the processes 
after reviewing the whole uh, incident process. And I was talking about the difference between these incidents and then a disaster using uh, distributed denial of service attack and just denial of service attack. We, the, where the difference is that uh, denial of service attack, usually this person who is attacking the system creates some sort of uh, robotic software within the system and use the system to attack a legitimate system, meaning that he will flood the system with a lot of uh, traffic, a lot of requests. When you flood the system with a lot of requests, you make the system slow. As uh, Isifu pointed out, let's say this system is serving company A, company B, or let's say customer A and customer B. So since this person is flooding the network, these are legitimate users. Using the system becomes slow. So because there's a lot of traffic and the system will become slow for A and B. Here, you can always handle it. You can handle the, 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 the denial of service attack. And in this case, it's incident. You can even handle it in a way so that you can restore the, the machine back, the services back so that it will be faster for them. But this same person can decide to use other machines and use the machines as a zombie, for instance. Uh, he will send an hardware containing some scripts, maybe to you, or you go to, or he embed that hardware, or he embed that script into a software and upload the software on the torrent site. You go and download the software. Once you download the software on the torrent and install your machine, uh, you get a script embedded in your hard drive. So in this case, the person can now control your system from the back end because of this script. So he's now using your system as a zombie, even though you may be using your laptop well, doing everything normal with your laptop, but he's using your machine as a zombie machine. So this machine, for instance, may belongs to Bofat. This one belongs to myself and then other person. And all our machines are being used as zombie machines. Even though you will not suspect anything for you, you are using your machine normal, but someone is using a zombie machine to attack a network. So when you use that one, attack a network, it means that here, if he's able to flood the network, with, let's say 1,000 requests in the, per second, and then he's using this your machine to also send 1,000 requests per second, 1,000 requests per second, 1,000 requests per second, 1,000 requests per second, you realize that with these four machines using a zombie, he's flooding the network with 4,000 requests per second. So this one is more, and once this one is more, the system, even the customer A, will not be able to use it at all completely. It will not even, the traffic is so flooded in such a way that he cannot even use his machine or the app at all to assess the system legitimately. So in this case, it is no longer an incident. It is, it is disaster. Because if you have a system, you have a mobile app, a mobile app, your customers are using the mobile app and they cannot use it. They click on the button and it is taking one year for the button to open. They can't use it at all. All because someone is flooding the network, making it difficult for legitimate users to use to do it. It is no longer an incident there. It is a disaster which has to be handled. But with the with just a denial of service attack, the system can just be slow, but not completely of slow. Yes, you can use it all right, but it's very slow. Here, you can manage it and handle it. But this one, it goes beyond an incident. It's a disaster. It is causing problem. So that's one way you can also differentiate between disaster and incident. So if the person is using just one, that's denial of service attack, then later on he decides to uh, add other zombie machines to attack the network, then meaning that it is no longer the incident. It now is related to disaster. Here, law enforcement involvement. Somebody asked a question regarding this. So if you're able to identify who is causing the problem, you're able to trace where the root cause and all that, you can involve the police to go and pick the person up. Or you can do a lot of investigation. You know, I don't know in Ghana whether we have cyber security uh, department in the police units. Sometimes all you need to do is also report to them they can also have their own investigation 
to get to know who is responsible in doing that, the person can be arrested. And the organization is able to track and know uh, who is involved in terms of the attack. That person can also be referred to the law enforcement agency for the person to be dealt with. So when an incident violates civil or criminal law, it is the organization's responsibility to notify proper authorities. Selecting appropriate law enforcement agency depends on the type of crime committed. So federal, state, and local. So involving law enforcement has both advantages and disadvantages. Usually much better equipped at processing evidence, obtaining statements from witnesses and involving legal cases. However, involvement can result in loss of, loss of control of chain of events following an incident. Now we are now going to talk about disaster recovery. So we are done with the incident. So we are now moving on to disaster. Any question up to this stage? Any question, any contribution, anything you want to share? Probably your experiences, you may, you, you may have had issues of uh, handling an incident or there was a disaster. You may want to share some experiences you had with the class. So the floor is open. Otherwise, I'll call somebody. Yeah, hello. Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. Um, I wanted to know. I wanted to know when an incident becomes a problem. An incident becomes a problem. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you say a problem, ask why. If the incident itself is a problem, or you you get it, the incident itself is a problem. Uh, you need to find a way to resolve it or stop it. So, but when it escalates, when it gets to a point where uh, at that point, there is a huge impact, things are not working. Everything is completely halted. There it is no longer an incident. It is not a disaster. Just like using the natural disaster, such as uh, what do you call it, a flood. You are working where you are, and there's a serious flood. The organization is, 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 is no, it cannot be, you, I mean, you cannot continue with your business. So in that case, it is not an incident, it's a disaster. But an incident, for instance, like I made mention, if the machine freezes, just one single machine that freezes, it's an incident, you can easily go and handle that. But when you realize, but if you realize that all the machines at operational level all freezes at the same time, and then you have tried your best to get the machines restored, but the machine is not able, you are not able to restore the machine back for them to work. In this case, it is no longer an incident. It has become a disaster at the moment. So you need to now trigger the disaster recovery team to find a way to see if they can recover the whole machines back for the, uh, the business to continue. And sometimes you may not be able to recover it. If you're not able to recover the machines, those machines, then you must now uh, rely on the business continuity plan. And that plan is where you may have to even relocate, go to another site, a hot site, a warm site, or a cool site. They all have advantages and disadvantages, and they are all part of the business continuity plan so that you can continue rather than staying at where you are for days, for months, for years, just to solve that problem. You need to trigger a second, a backup plan. So one of the backup plan is where you must have another site. So many businesses have a backup plan. Sometimes, uh, like, of course, I'll talk about the, the, those, those uh, sites, the hot, the warm, and then the cool site. So now disaster recovery plan is a preparation for and recovery from disaster, whether natural or man-made. So man-made, when you have hackers and crackers disturbing you, natural, when you have fire and a flood and all that. So organization is unable to contain or control the impact of an incident. So when the incident, you are not able to control it, you are not able to handle the incident. It is no longer incident, it becomes a disaster. So the level of damage or destruction from incident is so severe, the organization is unable to quickly recover. So in this case, you have, it, is become, it becomes a disaster and you need to now trigger the disaster recovery plan. Okay, so yes, 
Disasters can also be classified under natural and man made, which I said earlier. And then you can also look at the speed of development. We have the rapid and the slow on site disaster and then the slow on site disaster. So some of the disaster is so rapid that the impact is very huge. And some of them, uh, even though it's disaster, but it's very slow, meaning that, for instance, the, the, the the denial of service attack, for instance, you know, it starts with slow network. You know, people are not able to assess it. It's just weak. Then to the extent that it doesn't even work at all. So sometimes it's, it's rapid and sometimes it's also uh, slow. Let's look at planning for disaster. What time is it? What time are we supposed to close? 8.30? Yes, sir. 8.30. 8.30. Okay, so we still have some few minutes. Okay, let's look at the planning for disaster. So these are the key points, just as we did for the incident recovery. So you have to clear the rules, just like this, the, the incident uh, response team. The rules and responsibilities has to be clear, have the alert rooster and the notification of key personnel. Like I said, every department, every office, you have all the roosters, you have uh, key personnel, their uh, contacts and all that. Clear establishment of priorities. Uh, you know, I think Kudu spoke about you know, the priorities. And then since it becomes a disaster, sometimes you need to prioritize what you need to achieve first, move on to the next and all that. Then documentation, just as incident, is also very important. Then action steps to mitigate the impact. Yes, there's a disaster. So how do you mitigate? Here, actually also relies so much on the ingenuity and the strategy of the organization. For instance, you want to mitigate it. Now your problem is that your data has been hijacked <laughs> and then your, your business cannot even run if you don't have the data. Both the... If, if the data is hijacked on the, on the rear system, you may have a backup somewhere. So once it's hijacked, you can trigger BCP and use the backup data and continue with your business. However, this person who has hijacked the data can, may tell you that he needs a certain amount of money to not to release the data to your competitors or let's say to the public space. Then you have to find a way to manage and handle it, even though you can rule out a backup plan and allow your business to continue whilst you are handling this issue with the hacker. Alternative implementation for various system components. So if a system even breaks down, yes, uh, and it's not working at all, whoever has broken down is not working at all. It's a disaster because the whole organization is not running. You may have to go for you know, a new system and all that. Now, I, I spoke about the crisis management. Uh, if, the pro, if you are the cause of the problem, usually if it's an incident and you are the cause of it, uh, because it's incident, it can sometimes, you're, because you're able to handle it, uh, it doesn't trigger any psychological issues. But when it becomes a disaster and you are the cause, this one can bring a lot. For instance, if you did not do it intentionally, then the investigation, it has been established that you are the cause of it. It can have a toll on you. So usually you have a disaster management office that handles this, uh, the uh, crisis management office. So a set of focus steps taken during and after disaster that deal primarily with people involved. So a crisis management team manages events, supporting personnel. You go to Europe and other places, you know, like the crisis management team is health institution. Health, health institution, health facility. So, uh, uh, for instance, when I was with, you know, uh, in Finland, when you are a PhD student, uh, you receive a salary because, of course, they advertise they will advertise the position that you apply for it. So, if you apply, your proposal is good. They take you on as a worker. So you receive a salary until you graduate. And luckily, my master's, uh, I was 
uh, I was I got a scholarship also for the master. So I paid nothing for the tuition and also received monthly stipends. So as soon as I finished with that, I got a PhD. In two weeks' time, I just started a PhD. And the PhD, to I applied. They, are, they advertised the position with the grant and I applied. So you receive, uh, 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 what do you call it, um, uh, a salary. Now, because you receive salary, it, they have outsourced the health issues or health kind of, you know, uh, or let's say health issues to a health facility, a private, a private, you know, facility. And I think they will tell you the also. So when there's any health related issue, the, you go there, they resort to that particular department. So uh, crisis management, for instance, has also been outsourced to them. So whenever you're having a problem, there are some people who can be on the page. I remember when I went there to do my master's, there was this guy who was a teaching assistant to one professor, uh, teaching as a course in research method in computer, in computer science, research method in computer science. And he was a teaching assistant. And he was a TA, at that time he was doing his PhD. He had started his PhD for about three years. Do you know that when I, I was doing master's, I came to finish my master's and started my PhD and finished the PhD and this same person was still doing his PhD. So sometimes it can have a psychological tool, especially what you are researching on and you're having challenges, you know it's difficult for you, you're not able to do. You can also be referred to the hospital, the crisis management department. Then they will psych you and give motivation to continue. This, this person in question, he was on the PhD for 10 solid years and later uh, he couldn't finish. He couldn't actually finish it. He's from Namibia. So he couldn't finish and he has to go back to his country to start a software development company. So some of these challenges may happen and then you'll be referred to a crisis management department. And I'm saying that most of the businesses, the outsources, especially Iro, what I know, but in Ghana, I don't know, maybe you may want to share perspective or you may, you may want to tell about it. Uh, crisis management. Do you have a department handling that or you are sourced to a health sector to handle that? Mufat. Hello. Hello. Anyone? Doc. Yes, do you want to share your perspective? Um. Here in Kolebu, um, to the best of my knowledge, we aside the, the the board that they have or the committee that they have, most of the things the, the committee only sits to take decision on uh, the crisis, but they outsource for most of the things. So the okay. committee will just be there, then they'll take a decision whether um, they should use what the information they've, they've gotten or not. Okay. Tony, 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 take the floor, Tony. Hello, Tony, you are, you are uh, muted, yes. Good evening. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my, mine hasn't got to, gotten to do with uh, the IT system. I was with one okay. employee. Uh, who was addicted to a particular drug in the, uh, in the health sector. Okay. He was a, he was a staff, yes. but he was addicted to one okay. drug. And uh, management mm. later got to find out. Because of the stigmatization and other things, uh, she was referred to the psychology unit to be talked to. And uh, later, they had to change uh, her unit and a whole lot. But unfortunately, later she committed suicide. Uh, I see. I don't know. Simo. Maybe that didn't work for her. Yeah. So yeah. She died. yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Then, sorry to hear that. If you don't manage it, yeah. If you don't manage it, it's a it's, 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 it's serious issue. Imagine that. Uh, you make a, a little mistake, not deliberate, but just a little mistake, then your organization or where you are working is losing millions of money. 
I mean, you realize how the, the tool, the impact it will have it will have on you. So the organization put, put in place some of these to handle that. But like I said, if the investigation established that you did that deliberately, then you'll be referred to the law enforcement agency to be dealt with. Okay, so responding to disaster. With, with her own tool, yes. it was deliberate. She was addicted, she was really using the drugs. So management it was deliberate. to reassign her to a different unit and she couldn't stand the stigma. Yeah, she couldn't stand the stigma. Then wow, she had wow. to take her life. Yeah. Because everybody right. was like, you know, like, okay, because, because oh, yeah, you were changed to a different unit because of this and this. So people were talking about her all mm. along. And could it, so wow, does it wow. mean management didn't also take a right step? I think that, you know, some of these things, uh, does it mean when management it happens, uh, that's what, yeah, you know, there, there's always exceptions. It's possible that, well, they provided what she needs to know or what she needs to hear so that to stabilize her. But, you know, for some reason, uh, she couldn't cope. But you know, for me, uh, I would rather advise that the person resigns. If the person works in the organization and then uh, I realize that this is a uh, huge and it's having a toll on her, it's better she resigns from that firm, that organization, she moved out. That's the only way she can actually you know, contain this. But if you want to be in the same environment where people will be talking about you, you go here, they are talking about you go here, it's, 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 it's a problem. It's not everybody that can contain this. Some people will end up killing themselves. So to me, I think that when it happens that way, uh, you need to move. If the problem, if you are not even the cause, uh, and then the organization has branches, they can push you to another branch. For instance, if it's, let's say you are working with Ecobank and you are in Accra, Legon branch, and then something like that happens, and it happens that you are the cause. Yes, they can provide you all this crisis management, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, they can psych you and all that. But still, some people are not able to contain it. So the best, if you don't want to stack the person, transfer the person from that office to another office, better still, you tell the person to resign so that, you know, he can have his life. So some of these things are... <clears throat> Very dicey. So, crisis management team manages events supporting personnel and their loved ones during crisis. So, determine event impact on normal business operations when necessary, making a disaster declaration, keeping public informed about the event, and also communicating with outside parties. Okay, so responding to uh, disaster, actual events often are strict, even best of plans. So, to be prepared, disaster recovery plans should be flexible. If physical facilities are intact, begin restoration day. If organization facilities are un un unusable, take alternative actions. When disaster threatens organization at the primary site, disaster recovery plan becomes, becomes business continuity plan. You remember I said, when disaster threatens organizations at the primary site, then you move on to uh, business continuity plan. So that is where, from the primary side, you can now look at whether your organization has the hot, the warm, and the cold plan. And then they will come when I'm talking about the BCP. OK, so uh, business continuity plan. Business continuity plan. In all this, we must continue with our business. Our data is compromised. Uh, there's flood. There's fire. Uh, our system has been hijacked. The, we must have a way to continue with our business. There are some people, if the business go off for two days, they will actually opt for the competitor. Imagine that uh, the whole uh, Ghana Commercial Bank is shut down and it's not working. The app is not working. Nothing is working for two solid days. You see, you see the chaos it will bring. I'm telling you about half of the customers will think of leaving the bank. So one, once you must put in contingency plan in such a way that as soon as, you know, either a disaster or incident or case, let's say disaster or case, you must switch to BCP. 
so that your business continues. So if you are going, if it's going to, if there's going to be a gap, maybe about five hours, maybe 24 hours break, and then your business continues. Otherwise, if it is more than two days, three days, then it's, it's a very, it's, it's a problem. If it's the whole day, one day is even a problem. To ensure critical business functions can continue in the disaster, and mostly you have to rather focus on the critical business functions. You know, in, in every business, business organization is actually segregated in various functions. So you have the finance department, you have the marketing department, you have the IT department, uh, you have, let's say, uh, human resource management department. These are functions business functions or functional areas of an organization. So let's assume that there's a problem. You need to look at the critical business function, make sure that those critical business functions are in operation, are working. For instance, if let's say a finance department uh, or let's say operation, let me use, let me put operation here. Then under operation where they tell us and everything are all working and all that. You make sure that even if the finance department is not working for that 24 hours, uh, for 24 hours or let's say uh, 48 hours, make sure that operation are in place to serve your customers, to, to still maintain the intimacy. Or human resource management is to me, it's not a, a what we call it, a critical business function area. It's where they do the recruitment and all that. But you make sure that department like information technology, you it's a, it's a, it's a critical business function that has to be restored for the business to run and most properly managed by the CEO of the organization. Okay, so contingency, uh, continu continuity strategies. So this is what I've been talking about, and I think I'll end the lecture here and then next week we continue. So I said there are three exclusive use options. So if your company is experiencing disaster or you are into disaster, now uh, one of the contingency plans is that you should have site waiting for you. Let's assume that there is a disaster, there's flood, there's fire, the whole building is bent down. What do you do? You now have to resort to another site. So hot site is fully configured computer facility with all services. What it means is that, let's say this is your primary site. You have another site here. This primary site is in operation, your data, you have a server, everything. So your information technology infrastructure is the same thing replicated here and connected. So whatever you are doing here, there's a backup to this one. So once there's a problem here, you have a replica of what is here in this system. So quickly you move, you move, of course, everything is destroyed. So you move all the personnel to this one, you continue your operation. Meaning that this site is hot. The hardware, software, every infrastructure is hot. It's just like a copy of the primary site. But the code site, you only have a space. There's no hardware, there's no software, just a space. So that when there's a problem, it means that you have to bring in all your hardware, whatever infrastructure, and start the whole process here again. And the advantage of the hot side is that it's very expensive. You don't know when a, a disaster is going to occur and you pay a lot. But with the cold side, there is nothing there, it's very cheap. All you need to do is that whatever is remain here, you push them to the cold side. It is possible that everything will be completely bent here. Then you need to get new things and start the whole thing again. You only This one is only the space to allow you the space and the structure to allow you to operate. But the warm and the, the, the warm sit in between the cold and then the, 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 the hot side. You have some of the infrastructure here. It is possible you have some of the network installed, some of the softwares are installed and all that which can allow at least you to start operation. So not all of them, it is not the same as the primary site, but some of them. So once there's a problem here, <clears throat> you move in here, then you upgrade this part and continue your work. So many researchers believe that uh, it is best you go for the warm side, because this one is too expensive, but this one is cheap. But this one is a trade-off, you know, you get some of them, and of course, when you get there, when there's a disaster, you then uh, top it up and then continue your service. Then uh, if the space, what we call time shared. Time shared, like an exclusive use of a site. <coughs> time shared, you have a, 
uh, elite. Even this space, this space that I'm talking about, whether it's hot, warm, or cold, can be time shared. What it means is that uh, you have a business partner or a sister organization that will lease this space for you to use. Maybe they have a lot of branches and then they lease one of their branches to you as a backup for your business. Then the service bureau, that one is an agency. For them, their work is that they provide spaces for uh, companies when they need contingencies, uh, uh, space to operate or to continue their, their, their business. So they will lease, uh, they will give you a space, you use it, that you pay for it. Then we have mutual agreement. You can have, have two different uh, organizations, maybe Eco, Eco Bank and then Standard Chartered Bank. They have an agreement to go for one particular space so that in case this company has, there's a disaster here, uh, they use the space. This also has a disaster, they use the space. In other words, Standard can have uh, excess space. If EcoBank is having a problem, they give you the assist EcoBank to run and all that. And then we have a specialized alternative. So you have rolling mobile. Uh, when there's a disaster and you don't have a space like uh, a fiscal infrastructure, you can have a mobile space like a car or something and then have your services and all that. Okay, I'll leave it here and then we'll continue uh, next week. Please, any question? And of course, this you can go and read it. There's a lot of literature on it on the internet. Go and read more about it. Hot site, warm site, cold site, time shared, service due, mutual agreement, and the specialized alternative. In exams, I will bring question around this, this area. Uh, I'll usually my questions are in a story-like form, like a case. So I'll formulate a case, something like that, and then bring this one up. Okay. Any question? Please. Okay, sir. No, please. Are you sure you're not feeling sleepy? <laughs> 